Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. In my mind, it does not feel like March 2023. I don't know if anyone has the same thoughts. Do you know what this means is that this uh, was March 1st, was, my, was Beth and I's first days as the lead pastor here, uh, lead pastors of, of our church, Victory Church on the Rock, known Victory Church. So it's been just over two years since Beth and I have stepped in as the lead pastors. Yeah, it's been amazing. Thank you. Um, it, it, it doesn't feel like two years though, right? Like I feel like it's been like six weeks, you know, but it's been two years. I don't know why. Like I, I don't think I've ever had a moment in my life where time feels, feels like it's flying this fast. Like, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. But we just want to have taken an opportunity to say thank you to all of you who call uh, Known Victory Church home. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you for being a part of our lives. Thank you for being our friends. Thank you for being in our community. Thank you. We're so grateful um, for each and every one of you. But we also do believe that this is just the start of what God wants to do. We feel like we're just on the, on the, on the brink of something breaking through. Some, something's going to break out. Um, this is kind of how I'm feeling inside of me. And part of why we're going to start this series called Same God, part of why is because the whole theme is that what God has done before, it, he is the same God today. He is the same God who brought miracles in the scriptures, the same God who parted the ocean, the same God who, who, who a virgin gave birth to Jesus, the same God who slayed giants, the same God who conquered armies, that same God is still alive today and he's still moving today. But I think some of us, when it comes to this thought of that he's the same God, some of us, I think, we don't actually fully believe that. Because what happens is, is in our lives, we feel like we're constantly crying out to God in our distress. And I can't be the only one who, over the past few years, there's been a lot of crying out to God, and I'm in desperate need of help, and I'm in desperate need of a Savior. And so sometimes we approach God as if he's not the same God. We see, we read the Bible and we compare our mundane, we compare our average, we compare our typical, and we compare it to the stars of the Bible. Right, we compare our lives to the heroes of the Bible. There are stories that are epic and filled with heroes and giants and, and, and adventure. And we look at our lives we're like, man, like, like I'm just getting over, overworked by laundry and dishes. It's like, like, I don't even have the energy to go fight a giant because I'm still trying to fold my kids' clothes from three weeks ago. And now they've grown out of them. And so now I'm trying to get rid of clothes and I'm trying to buy new clothes. And I just have this mountain. Like one of our guest bedrooms is now just a mountain of clothes. That's not true, okay? But that's how it feels sometimes. It's like, where'd my bed go? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll put them away tomorrow. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you don't do this. Maybe you're better than me. But you just look at your bed. It's like real late. And you're like, yeah, it's not gonna happen tonight. And you put him on the floor and this magic, I don't know how this happens in, in life, but it's magic because what happens the next day is all of a sudden the clothes are back on my bed. I don't know how they got there. I think it's magic. Um, but they get back on my bed and I just, I'm thinking, wow, I don't like this. So I put them back on the floor, right? And they end up back on my bed. But we compare our average, we compare the mundane, we compare our typical lives to the heroes of the Bible. And so what this looks like is we look at ourselves and we think, man, how come God isn't doing that still? Right? How, how come God is not doing that? How come my situation, my giant, my mountain, how come it's such a struggle for me? So we're constantly crying out to God. But I want to tell you, if you read through Scripture, there's a lot of crying out. Right? There's a lot of moments where people are in desperate need of help just like us, and they cry out to God. And do you know what's really powerful? Is that God always, always, always comes through. But do you know what he doesn't do sometimes? Is come through in the way that we want. Right? Sometimes he doesn't do the things that we wish he would do. He does something that we think at the time is going to destroy us, but actually what it does is it's growing us to actually be ready for the calling he has on our lives. We all go through trials. We all go through hard moments, and we need to realize that he is the same God. He is the same God, and throughout this series, we're going to be going through some people from the Bible we're going to be going through what God did for them and how I truly believe he's going to do the same for you and he's going to do the same for me. And maybe you've already experienced some of the things that we're going to be going through through this. But we're going to be starting today talking about Jacob. And if you know Jacob, he's in the Old Testament. You know, he's uh, 
great guy. Did some bad things too, though, like all of us. He had a story, like we all do. And if you know the lineage, you know that Jacob was the son of Isaac, and Isaac was the son of Abraham, right? This is the three, like, kind of big heroes of the Old Testament. You read through Genesis, Exodus. You see these guys, Genesis. And there's two things that I, that I think really come out in the story of Jacob um, when it comes to who God is and what he'll do uh, for each and every one of us. And number one uh, that God does is that God is the God of the covenant. Now, the question I think for some of us is like, what is covenant, right? What is a covenant? I think it's, you know, we've seen this throughout scripture. Maybe you read the Bible and you kind of understand it, but it's like, what is a covenant? Really, what a covenant is, is it's a relationship between two partners who are making binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They're often accompanied by oaths or signs or ceremonies, which if you read through the Old Testament, you see a lot of this. Covenants define obligations and commitments, but they are different from a contract because they are relational and personal. It's not like God's like, hey, sign the dotted line here for your five-year contract, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm gonna have a covenant relationship with you. It's not just business. It's actually also relational, what this covenant is. And think of it as a marriage. A husband and wife choose to enter into a formal relationship, binding themselves to one another in lifelong faithfulness and devotion. They then work as partners to reach a common goal like building a life or raising children together, right? That is what a covenant is. That's what covenant is. And Beth and I, right, as, as we're married, we're in a covenant relationship with one another where we're faithful to each other, we're devoted to one another, we're fighting together, we are a team together. And this is really what God does in our lives is he is the God of covenant where he comes in and says, hey, I want you and I'm gonna give you what you need. I'm gonna be there for you. I'm gonna give you my son. That's what God does for us. Beth and I, though, we're in this covenant relationship, almost the same thing, and throughout scripture, we see many covenants, right? If you read through the Old Testament, you see covenant, 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 all of them, like all the, t- all the way from Adam all the way through, you see so many of these covenant, covenants, but there's main covenants that really, if we understand these five main ones, I think it really just kind of opens up the Bible and really opens up the redemptive story that God has pl- had planned from the beginning on what he was gonna do, how he was gonna bring his son. And that's what we're gonna kind of go through today is the, the, the one of the covenants, which is the, the covenant of Abraham, right? The, the covenant that God showed to Abraham. And each of these covenants, if you go through them, and I would encourage you, if you have time, like read through Genesis, read through Exodus, and just see the redemptive story that God has. It's unbelievable when you actually under, fully understand it. But God always, in the case of a covenant, what he does is he uses ordinary people who love God, and then he uses them to do extraordinary things. So I think some of us were waiting for God to call us by the, when we're actually ready for it, but he's saying, no, no I'm going to call you before you're ready for it. All you have to do is follow me and listen to my commandments, follow what I'm saying, and then I'm going to take you places you could only dream of. You don't actually have to have the talent. You don't actually have to have the ability, but when God calls you, he'll qualify you. He'll prepare you. He'll get you ready for what's next for you, and that's what God did with all of these people is he called them and said, I'm going to prepare you for something absolutely incredible. I'm going to take you, this ordinary person that loves me, and I'm going to do something powerful through you. And we're going to be talking about the covenant God made with Abraham and how it filtered through the generations. And this is Abraham's covenant, and we see it in Genesis 17, verse 48. This is what it says. This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, it will be Abraham. For you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Right? This is the covenant that God speaks to Abraham when he changes his name from Abram to Abraham, the father of the nations. And then we see this reinstated, God reinstates or reiterates this covenant with Isaac, Abraham's son. This is what he says in Genesis 26. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land and I will be with you and bless you. 
I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I, just as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands, and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. Notice, he's saying, I'm going to give you this, not because your dad was talented, but because he was faithful. Not because your dad had the education, but it's because he actually followed the commands. I think for a lot of us, we need to really, really realize this, that when it comes to relationship with God, when it comes to relationship with Jesus, it's less about, it's less about who, like, like, like what you're capable of. It's more about who you are. It's more about actually following his voice, letting him actually guide you, letting him actually lead you. That's what it's all about. And that's what, how they got this promise was because they were faithful. They listened to the requirements and they obeyed. It's not rocket science, right? Like we just have to listen to what God is saying and actually follow it. And then if we continue, uh, we see uh, God again. He does the exact same thing with Jacob. He reiterates this covenant with the third generation, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the third generation right here. And this is what it says. Uh, in Genesis 35, verse 9 to 13. Now that Jacob had returned... God appeared to him again at Bethel. God blessed him saying, your name is Jacob, but you will, no longer, uh, you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. So God renamed him Israel. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants, and I will give you the land I once promised. I gave to Abraham and Isaac, yes, I will give to you and your descendants after you. Then God went up from the place where the, he had spoken to Jacob. So again, we see the same covenant, the same conversation, the same thing in three different generations, years and years and years apart. God is saying, I am going to make your family fruitful and multiply. I'm gonna make your family powerful. I'm gonna make your family walk in the abundance. I'm gonna give your family land. I'm gonna give you all that you could ever dream or desire. But it's interesting because up until Jacob, they hadn't really seen the fullness of it yet. Right? If you look back at Abraham, he, he, was, he, he, did, he had like two kids. Right? He, he, he had one that he shouldn't have had, and then he had another one. And then we see this kind of happen over and over where they don't actually fully get the promise. Yet Jacob steps in, and he kind of takes the place as the third generation saying, I'm going to actually be the one to fulfill the covenant. If you see Jacob, that's when things start to explode for Israel. That's when things start to explode for this. But what's really beautiful is that it's not just these generations. This promise, this covenant, this promise goes for generation to generation because in, in Galatians 3.29, this is exactly what it says. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and the pr God's promise to Abraham belongs to you you so the same God that that, that 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 gave Abraham a son the same God who 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 who, who took Moses who, who Moses took people out of the out of Egypt the same God who did all of these things is the same God for you and we actually inherit the same promises that he gave to them it's the same covenant it's the same God and I think we need to start acting like it we have to start trusting God in his faithfulness because what happens, and we see this if you read through those three guys' stories, a lot of the time they tried to do it on their own and it got them into a lot of trouble. Saying, God, where, where's my son? Where is he? You promised me the stars in the sky. All I see is a helicopter in the sky and it's moving. It's not staying. I see one light in the sky, and, and that's what he sees, right? The one. But he was not ready for the multitude that was about to come. All that, that, that these three men could hold on to was the promise and the covenant and God's faithfulness. They didn't fully see it all come to place. They had to wait year after year, moment after moment, decade after decade, waiting for the promise. And some of them, they never fully got the fullness of that promise, of that covenant. But the beauty is that those of us who follow Jesus, we have the fullness of it now, which is Jesus. Jesus is the, the king. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the one who will rescue you. He is the one who will save you. He is the one. We have access to him when we give our lives to Jesus. Now, I don't know what promises you're holding on to from God right now. I don't know some of the things maybe God has spoken to you that you haven't seen happen yet. 
Maybe some of the things that you saw as a kid or when you saw when you were a teenager, you saw when you were a young adult that time just kind of got by and sometimes we even forget the promise. I don't know what promises you were holding on to, but I believe that what God did for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he can do through you as well. I believe that we, that, that, that the same God who rescued them, the same God who chose them, the same God who took them to rescue a nation, that same God still lives today and he will do the same in your life. The mountains in front of you, the giants you're facing, the problems, the financial struggle, the health concerns, I truly believe that God is in the business of redemption and God is in the best business of restoration. I truly believe that it's the same God who rescued them can rescue you. The same God who saved them can save you. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Why aren't we actually acting like it? Why do we go through life and we're so timid about sharing Jesus? And I get it. I'm not saying it's easy. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Yet a lot of us, we're walking around like we're zombies and we're dead. We have the same God, the same covenant that conquered armies is still living today. We need to start actually understanding his power, understanding who he is, and start acting like we actually have that power. You know, this is exactly what the Israelites needed when they were stuck in slavery, right? In Egypt. They needed a savior. They needed a way out. They needed a reminder of the promise because how easy is it to forget how easy is it to forget when God speaks something? Maybe I want you to, to start a business and I'm behind it. I want you to do this. But say, ah, no, I got to feed my family. I, no, I can't do that today. No, because there's something more. We need to start listening to what God is saying and being obedient to it. That's when the promise actually becomes a reality. But the Israelites needed a savior, and then in comes Moses, right? Moses is minding his own business until all of a sudden he sees a bush and it's burning, but it's not burning. And he thinks, that's pretty odd. So he goes to inspect it, and then he hears God speaking to him out of this bush. And this is what it says in Exodus 3, 6. I am the God of your father, of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now this, this story is really fascinating to me because why did God use the name of Jacob when he had changed his name to Israel, right? It's a good question. Because he also didn't use Abram, he used Abraham, right? So why did God, with Moses, when he kind of introduces this thought, why does he say the God of Abraham, who th that would have been a hero to them, like that would have been like, that's the guy, like he'd be in the hall of fame, right? Like he'd have his jersey hung in the rafters, that guy and Isaac and Jacob, but he doesn't use the name Israel. And it's, I find this really fascinating. There's a few reasons why people think uh, that he did this. Because if you read through the story of Jacob, often, most of the time, he's referred to as Jacob. But it's really fascinating to me um, because, again, if you remember in Genesis 32, verse 28, right, it says, your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, go, and you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. So why did God... You say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's very interesting because how I kind of see this, so when you look at the name Jacob, what it really meant was sub subplanter or deceiver, right? And so that's what Jacob was known for. Why? Because he had stolen the birthright. He had taken the blessing. Like he had just been deceiving and stealing. Like he put fake hair on himself to trick his dad into getting the blessing. Like he was a full-on deceiver, right? He was a guy who had his own problems, who had his own story, but he still was a hero. And I think it's really fascinating. Why did God use the name of Jacob? How I believe this is because Moses needed to realize that God can use anybody who's broken to do something powerful. Right, Moses, you remember Moses, he's like, he calls Moses, he's like, yo, go. And he's like, I can't even talk. You're asking me, I'm a murderer. I've killed a guy. I ran away, went to the wilderness for 40 years, just ran away, and then the burning bush shows up, and he's like, you're the guy. He's like, I can't even talk properly. And God says, no, I'm the God of Jacob, the same God who restored Jacob, the same God who brought the blessing through Jacob. I will do through you. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I am with you. Some of us, we need to realize that no matter what we've done, no matter what we've gone through, no matter our fear, no matter our problems, God can still use you. God can still use you. And some of us, we've gotten so bad because our self-esteem is so poor. 
that we're not willing to do anything. This is really where Moses was, right? How could you use me? He says, no, I'm the God of Jacob too. The one who was a deceiver. The one who literally got in a fight with me. I used him. I can use you too. I want to tell you, you are never too far gone for God to use you. You might say, well, my IQ is so low. God can still use you. You may say, but I've, but I've been divorced. I'm saying, tell you, God can still use you. You may say, yeah, but I've had an abortion. But I'm saying, God can still use you. You might say, but yeah, but, but, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know the people I've hurt. I want to tell you, God can still use you no matter what you've done. You are never going to be too far away. I think all of us, it's so interesting because we walk around as if our past doesn't really affect our decisions. And we don't want people to know. We don't want people to know our story. Because they're like, yeah, if only they knew, then they, they might not even let me through the doors, you know. But God says, no, I am the God of Jacob too. I'm the God of the deceiver. I'm the God of the God of the guy who stole the birthright and stole the blessing. I am his God too. He's telling Moses, I am going to use you to do something that you're not even capable of. He will use you too. You know, I believe that today, as we think about this same God, I believe that God might be asking you to do something you believe you cannot do. And I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it is that you're trying to make a decision on and you're looking at your own resources, you're looking at your own stature, you're looking at your own intelligence, you're looking at your own education, you're looking at your job and you're saying, I cannot afford that. Right? Like, I, I, like I, you've, you've called the wrong guy. Do you know who I am? Like, God, no, I can't do that. I'm not capable of doing that. And I think we need to realize again that, that the same God who used Moses, the same God who used Jacob, the same God who used David, the same God who used Mary can use you as well because the same power still exists today. The whole Bible is a redemption story of God getting his children back. I want you to know God wants you. God doesn't just love you. He likes you. He wants you in his life. He wants you to partner with him in reaching people. He wants you to partner with him. Again, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter who you've hurt, no matter what you've seen, he loves you and he will use you. The same God of Jacob is the same God of you. Again, God often qualifies the call before he calls the qualified because God used an ordinary man, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring this incredible blessing to start this redemption story and getting his children back to bring Israel back to God. We need the same thing in our city. You know what my family needs on a personal level? I need the same God to do what he did then, to do it now. The same God who provided then, that he'll provide now. The same God who healed then, that he'll heal now. The same God who brought what I needed, that he'll do it now like he did before. That's what my family needs. And I'm telling you, I think your family probably needs it too. The, 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 your kids who ran away and they don't follow Jesus and they don't even want a relationship with you. You need the same restoration and redemptive power in your life. The same God. And when it comes to God, we have to stand on his faithfulness. Because that's really what we have. We have, to, we have to stand on the fact that he, what he did, he will do, even if our circumstance, even if it's painful, even if we can't see two feet in front of us, we just keep walking and say, God, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, and we just keep taking the steps forward. I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. That's how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob got the blessing, is by faithfulness and obeying. And what's beautiful is that even we're not faithful, God still is. You know, like when I'm not faithful, when I'm walking away from the covenant, when I'm cutting the ties, when I'm saying the things I shouldn't say, when I'm walking in the places I shouldn't walk, God is still faithful to me even when I'm so broken and, and so far away. He's still so faithful. 
And all we have to do, it's same as the prodigal son. If you know that story, he runs away, takes his dad's money, runs away, spends it all, comes back, says, I want to work for you. And his father sees him from a way out and runs to him. It's the same thing when it comes to God's faithfulness. When, when he sees you coming back, he will run to you. He doesn't make you wait. He doesn't wait for you to come all the way. He says, I'm pursuing you. I'm going to come after you, and then I'm going to throw a party for you. Hold on to God's faithfulness. We might not deserve it, but that's the beauty of it. We might not have the talent or the ability, but it's God that is the one working through us. And in Luke 20, verse 37, I think this is so interesting. It says this, but now, as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush, right? What we just read. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord, and this is so powerful, as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's interesting. Why this is so interesting, if you continue reading this, it says that the people were fascinated by this teaching. Why? Because God, because what Jesus is saying, he's saying that the promise is, is not dead. The promise is still alive. The promise of, 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 of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is still alive today. He's saying, I am the God of Israel. Jesus then goes on to say, he's, God is the God of things that are alive, that things that are not dead. What this means for us is that the promises are still alive today. And that even when things get hard, even when life gets turmoil, his promises are still alive today. Hold on to the faithfulness of the Father. Don't quit on the promises of God because it's hard. Don't quit when you get exhausted. When you get exhausted, it's not time to quit. It's time to bring somebody else along to help carry the weight. When you're exhausted, when you're tired... I think a lot of us right now, we're tired. Like we're tired, like exhausted as humanity right now. I think we really are. I don't think we realize it, but we're very tired. We're tired of chaos. I think we're tired of war. I think we're tired of pain. I think we're tired of brokenness. Like I am. I'm tired of seeing what's happening all over the world and wars and and earthquakes and shootings happening in schools. Like I'm I'm tired. I'm tired of people being so mean to each other and hurting each other. Like, I'm tired. But we can't stop fighting. You know, when I was in, in YWAM, we were working, again, if you know the story, we were working with human trafficking. We were working with, you know, prostitutes and people who purchase prostitutes and selling their bodies and whatever it is, you know, sex workers. We are working with them. And it's such an overwhelming place to be. Because there's so much need, and there's almost, if you think of it, very little that you can do, right? Because there's thousands of people in our country, hundreds of people in our city who are walking through this, and we don't even see it. And we feel like we can't make a difference, right? And I remember this story that was told to me there, and after this this tsunami had come in, all these uh, fish were on the shore. And this kid, he, he starts walking and starts throwing the fish into the water, right? He just starts throwing the fish. He's like, okay, throwing the fish. This guy comes up to him. He's like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm saving the fish. He's like, no, you're not. You're like, this is mean, means nothing. He's like, but I'm doing it just for the one. I think for us, it's the same thing. It might feel overwhelming. The problem you're facing might feel like it's too much, but just take small steps forward and eventually you're gonna get to the finish line. Eventually, you're going to make it to the end. Eventually, it's going to happen. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it feels overwhelming, but get some people alongside you and start to make a difference right now. Don't quit on the promises God has given to you. Don't stop fighting. Don't stop believing. Don't stop pursuing. Keep your arms up and keep alert and keep on fighting. Do not quit. You know, don't give up on the promises just before the breakthrough. You know, the moment just before breakthrough, it feels like our breaking point, but oftentimes that's actually God's starting point. Where we get to a point where we're like, I can't, he's like, we're like, I can't keep going. He's like, finally, now I can actually start to work with you. You know, for Abraham, it it was 25 years that he waited for the promise. 25 years of waiting. Some of us, we can't wait for 2.5 seconds. You know, our attention spans now, our, our, our faithfulness now, our loyalty now, it's like all like just so small. We live in this society where we want everything just literally right now. You know, I ordered something online and I wanted it to come the next day and it took two days. And I was like, to be honest, was frustrated. 
Like, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, why am I paying for free shipping, one day shipping or two day shipping when it's gonna come in three? It's a waste of money. It's like 25 years. Imagine ordering a package and it doesn't arrive for 25 years. It's like, that's like, like, especially if it's technology, like this is literally pointless now. It's like a VHS player. You're like, it's like this means nothing now. I gotta go buy Dumbo at the, goodwill right 25 years he waited you know some of us we gave up on the promise way too early we gave up on fighting way too early and I'm not telling you it's easy to keep fighting that's not what I'm saying it's not like I'm not it's very hard to keep going but imagine Abraham right 25 years he sees the stars of the sky that's yours the nations, the land, it's all coming to you. And then he gets to the end of his life. Guess what? He hadn't seen it yet. It wasn't there yet. Right? He had his kid, kids. He's waited every week, every month, every year, every decade. Sarah, are you pregnant yet? No. Let's try again. (laughs) Are you pregnant yet? No. Guy turns 100. Are you pregnant yet? Yep. Yep. What? You know. Right? Just, I don't know, I can imagine, at least me, I'd be complaining. God, you promised. Where's my kid? You said I'm going to be the father to the nations. That means I actually have to be a father to at least one kid, right? Nothing. God, where are you? Nothing. God, you said, it's like I'm getting old, like I'm 82 now. It's been seven years. Where are you? Nothing. 10 years later, 92 years old. He's like, where are you, God? It's been a long time. Keep on waiting. He says, I promised you, keep on waiting. Keep on being patient. Keep being faithful. Keep being obedient. Your time will come. And Jacob, right? Steals the birthright, steals the blessing, gets in a fist fight. Now he can barely walk. Has 12 sons. And a famine comes and they think their son Joe is dead and the famine comes and they finally start to see the blessing break out. They had the land. They were fruitful. If you read through it, it says they were fruitful. And the covenant came alive again through Jacob. Keep on fighting. Do not quit. I wonder how many promises are in this room that we've actually buried in the ground because we weren't willing to wait. How many promises are in this room that, we, that we've kind of held on to, but we're like, no, it's too hard. I'm getting too old. My time is near, right? <laughs> how many promises in this room are laying dormant because we haven't allowed God's power to re- resurrect them again? I don't know the promises in your life. I don't, I don't know what God has spoken to you. God has spoken a lot of things to me. You know, for my family, for our church. And you know, sometimes, I'll be honest, there's times where I look at what God has promised me. I'm like, God, I'm not seeing it. Like, like we, he promised me, like let's say he promised you like a field full of trees and you're looking at your pile of rubble. And you're like, something's different. But what, God, what has God spoken to you? Do not let the promises of God lay dormant in your life. Allow God's power to come back in and let's resurrect these things. Our city needs it. Your family needs it. You know, the promise of God, really, it starts in the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply. And that leads us to the last thing here is that God is the God of generations. If you look at that, Moses, right? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, three generations to bring the blessing. God is the God of generation. We call on the God of Jacob personally for our kids. The God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of David. We call on them saying, what you have, I need too. I need it for my kids too. His faithfulness is all that we can stand on. What he did for Jacob, I truly believe he will do for you. He will do for your family as well. He will take the most broken pieces and create a beautiful masterpiece out of the most broken parts of our soul. 
He can reach the hardest of hearts. He can love multiple generations. He can bring your kids back who have walked away. He can do it. And I believe that God is saying to us today this. I will continue to reach the generations. I will reach their children, or your children, and their children, and their children, and their children, and their children. I will keep my promises. You might not see the fullness of the promise I have given you, but it's coming. Be patient. I think God is saying, be patient. I also think one thing he's really speaking, and this is what he's been speaking to me, is it's time to find rest for your souls. Rest. Again, we're tired. Like really, like, like most of the time I ask someone, how are you doing? It's not like I'm good, I'm bad. It's like I'm tired. I think that's my response every day. Like, how are you? I'm, I'm tired today. It's like, yeah, probably. We need rest really badly right now. And not just like physical rest where we lay in our bed for two days. Right? That's good too. But do you know what we really need? Is spiritual rest. I think a lot of the times we're in so much turmoil with our situations, with our lives, with our world. And I get it. But God is saying, please, Jesus is saying, please, come to me all who are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And I think that's what we really need. I think God is saying, please rest in my arms. Again, Abraham, he saw the covenant yet he didn't experience the fullness of it. Isaac got the covenant but he didn't experience the fullness of it. Jacob was really where everything exploded where the blessing came in the abundance I want to encourage you when it comes to the generations do not stop praying for your kids ever ever I, I know for some of us our kids have really hurt us like really hurt us I know some of us and so what this does is sometimes in our lives we've built these grudges towards our children and some of us towards our parents that we're not even willing to pray for them anymore do not stop praying for your children. I know they've hurt you. Do not stop praying for your parents. I know some of us who've been really hurt by our parents. Do not stop praying for them. You know, Malachi 3.6, this is when we're gonna kind of close the message with today, says this, I am the Lord and I do not change. This is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. <laughs> right? How many times could Israel have been wiped off the face of the planet? But God was faithful. You know, God could have opened the sea and then closed it real quick, right? See ya, you know, we're going to start again. I just said, I said I wouldn't flood the earth. I didn't say I wouldn't pour water on, the, on Israel, right? Never. How many moments could this have happened? But he says, no, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you are not destroyed yet. If you're still breathing, God is still moving. If you're still walking, if you're still talking, if you're still breathing, God is not done with you yet. I don't care if you're 150 years old or under one years old. God is not done with you yet. God is not done with your children yet. God is not done with your family yet. God is not done with our city yet. God is not done with our homes yet. God is still moving. If we're still breathing, he's still moving. We say, God, you do not change. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so I stand on your faithfulness. And I say, the same God who did it then, God, do it again today. That is what we need so badly the same God. And that's why we call on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We say, God, the same covenant, the same promise. Do it again today. Edmonton desperately needs your love.